Alex Kennedy, hoopshype.com. And uh, make sure you check out Alex's podcast now, which is doing really well on the iTunes charts. It's uh, the Hoops Hype podcast now uh, available. He can give you the details on that. And uh, he finds the most interesting guys. He had um, Kwame Brown. He found Darrell Wright. Like, he found the whole 2013 Sixers team somewhere. (laughs) What's going on, man? How are you, Alex? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you? Awesome. Uh, Yeah, I mean, uh, Doug Collins, Kwame Brown, uh, Darrell Wright, like the 2012-2013 Sixers. You've you've managed to find all of them. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. You know, I've tried to mix it up with the podcast. We've had some guys that... Um, you know, our big names, we had John Wall, C.J. McCollum, uh, Miles Turner, who obviously uh, has a lot to say right now with Paul George being on the market. Those guys were all really interesting to kind of pick their brain about being stars in the NBA. And then we also wanted to, you know, bring on guys that have really interesting stories. So I brought Darrell Wright on. He talked about, um, you know, what it was like playing in Golden State uh, during Clay Thompson's rookie year, Steph Curry's sophomore year. Uh, he had some interesting stuff to say about that. Um, I had Karan Butler on, and he was a fantastic interview. Um, a lot of people don't know Karan Butler's backstory. Um, when he was 11 years old, he actually started selling cocaine, and he was arrested 15 times by the age of 15. So, you know, he was in a juvenile detention center. That's when he realized that, you know, he liked basketball, started playing basketball there, turned his life around completely, um, you know, completely got out of the streets, stopped doing anything illegal, became a two-time All-Star and NBA champion. So we've tried to mix it up. We've had some really big names on, and then we've also had some guys that just have really interesting stories that, you know, haven't really been told. Um, you know, guys like Darrell Wright and Karan Butler uh, can be really interesting. I, I always like to kind of pick their brain and uh, and just talk about their life. Uh, check out the Hoops Hype podcast uh, in the iTunes uh, and uh, check that out. Uh, as uh, Alex does a great job, you know, all these uh, different things we've talked about when Alex is typically on with us on Friday show about uh, how players pick agents and how free agencies work and how trades go on. You'll uh, find out about all that kind of stuff uh, with him. And, of course, here as well when we talk to Alex weekly about the NBA. Uh, let's first get your uh, kind of overview of the draft since we didn't get to talk on Friday. The Sixers make the trade, they get faults, and then kind of what happened after that. Um, you know, give us your thoughts on, on how the a couple of highlights for you of what stood out with the draft. Well, you know, I think uh, I made it clear to you before that I think Fultz is the best player in this draft. So, um, you know, that that didn't change, obviously. Uh, I think uh, it, it's going to be really fun watching this Philadelphia team moving forward with this core. Um, I, the big surprise for me was Jason Tatum going number three to Boston over Josh Jackson. Uh, I think Tatum is a good player, but I think Josh Jackson has uh, a higher ceiling. Um, and then I think, you know, some of the trades that went down just leading up to the draft and then on draft night were really the big surprises. Seeing Jimmy Butler get traded to Minnesota was a surprise. But, you know, that was discussed last year between uh, Chicago and Minnesota. But, um, I, you know, I, I wasn't a big fan of the deal from Chicago's standpoint. I thought they could have gotten more for Butler. And I didn't think they were really in a position where they had to trade Butler. He was under contract for a few more years. Uh, it's not like, you know, the Paul George situation where he can threaten to leave. Um, so it, it was a bit strange. You know, Dwayne Wade picked up his option. It seemed like they were going to, you know, try to keep focusing on winning now and trying to be a playoff team. And then all of a sudden you trade away Jimmy Butler and go young. So you had that move. You had the uh, Brooke Lopez, D'Angelo Russell trade. There were just a lot of things happening uh, leading up to the draft. So I think the trades and the activity in the week leading up to the draft was probably the biggest surprise for me. Um, and then on draft night, you know, there weren't a ton of crazy picks. Uh, I, I think it, it pretty much went how we expected. Um, you know, there were a few guys that slipped here and there, but nothing, you know, completely crazy. Uh, your thoughts on uh, after Fultz, the Sixers got a couple of guys. you know anything about uh, Pazekis? P- P- how do you say this again? <laughs> Pazekis. <laughs> Andres Pazekis. The Lithuanian. Uh, yes, you know. <laughs> uh, obviously. Uh, Bolden, Jonah Bolden, and uh, a couple of uh, uh, interesting picks here. A lot of people seem to like Bolden. Yeah, it's funny. Um, you know, the Ringer did a really good article on. Uh, I did see that on on Bolden. Yeah, they basically said that he was the uh, the steal, you know, of the draft potentially. Um, that you know he he was one of the guys that 
was, uh, you know, being really underrated and, and someone to watch. Um, you know, I thought that was uh, that was really interesting. Um, and then uh, Jawan Evans, too. He's another guy that I think could be interesting. Um, you know, he, he's someone that uh, that was selected in the second round. I did an interview with him uh, during the pre-draft process, and he actually finished uh, his NCAA career with the fourth highest assist percentage in NCAA history. He's a really good passer, makes teammates around him better. Um, I, I like his game a lot. Uh, talk with Alex Kennedy here, hoopshype.com. Uh, also, uh, for people out there, uh, his piece on uh, the life of NBA scouts. Now I thought this was really stuff. interesting here. <laughs> if uh, you can give a couple nuggets to the listeners on on this story, which was really well done. Yeah, um, it, it was something that I wanted to do for a while because I think they're kind of the unsung heroes of the uh, front office. People don't really know about scouts. Uh, even diehard NBA fans, you know, they can name general managers even some agents, but I don't know most people, even media members, can't really name scouts. Uh, yet these guys uh, are just really overworked. They're not really paid what they're deserving. Uh, and, you know, they travel year-round so much. Um, basically, in the article, I wanted to kind of paint the picture of what their life is. And it's a really solitary lifestyle. They travel, uh, you know, for most of the year. They're away from their family. Um, you know, a few of the guys talked about how it's really hard to have a marriage and have kids while still being a scout because you're always on the road. Um, you know, they watch a ton of film. And these are guys that are, are a really big part of the decision-making process when it comes to the draft and free agency and trade. Um, basically, every team has a database that they put information into. Uh, and it starts with the draft, and then they kind of keep updating every player's file throughout their career. And the scouts are a huge part of that. You know, they go, they scout these guys uh, in college, they scout international guys, and then you have pro personnel scouts that continue to scout players while they're in the NBA. So basically, I just wanted to kind of talk about, you know, the role of the scouts. There's a lot of misconceptions about scouts. Um, you know, a lot of their job isn't just watching basketball, it's gathering information. So uh, one of the guys said, you know, he feels more like a private investigator than anything because, you know, he, he basically is calling coaches, friends, uh, you know, nearby bars. He's calling people that worked at the school. He's trying to see if the guy, you know, drinks a lot, smokes a lot. He's trying to see what his relationship with a girlfriend is like. It's just, it's a really strange uh, job because, you know, on one hand, you're evaluating their basketball skills and then on the other hand, you're gathering information, looking at body language and demeanor and trying to, you know, see what a guy's personality is. So it was interesting to kind of, uh, you know, pick their brain a little bit and see what the life of a scout is like. And then also I, I really I, – one thing I, I enjoy with that article is I asked each of the scouts a uh, player they were wrong about. And I thought that was kind of fun hearing them, you know, look back at some of their biggest misses. Uh, Clay Thompson came up. Uh, a few guys said Isaiah Thomas. Uh, they, you know, one guy said he didn't think Isaiah Thomas could even be a backup point guard. He didn't have him being draftable at all. Um, one guy said James Harden was a big miss of his. Uh, Avery Bradley was another one. Uh, there, it, it was kind of interesting hearing them kind of talk about guys that they that they really missed on. Um, but no, I mean it, it's definitely a job that these guys are underappreciated. They don't get a lot of credit. They're not in the spotlight. Um, and it's a hard job. Uh, it really does take a toll on, you know, their, their family life and then also your body too. You know, these guys are, get very little sleep. They're constantly traveling. They're not really eating healthy because they're always on the road and eating fast food and, you know, up at crazy hours during the day. So it, it was just something I wanted to kind of write about because I feel like it's one of those things that a lot of people don't realize or a lot of fans don't know much about when it comes to the scout lifestyle. Alex Kennedy with us, hoopshype.com. As I'm listening to you talk about scouts in the NBA, Alex, it jumps out to me like there there is no wonderlick test like the NFL, and, and the way talent is evaluated in the NBA or for the NBA is much different than in some of the other sports. Yeah, and that was one of the things that they talked about, that you know they watch these basketball games completely different than fans watch games. Um, whenever a fan watches a game, obviously you're following the ball and you're looking at certain star players and, um, things like that. But whenever a scout watches a game, usually they're honing in on one or two players and they're just watching them the entire time. And it's not necessarily watching them just from a basketball standpoint. You know, you want to see their skill set and you want to see their talent, but you're watching to see how he interacts with his teammates, 
how he handles being benched, you know, how he talks to the referees. Does he let fans get into his head whenever he's, you know, struggling? Um, you want to see his demeanor. You want to see how he warms up. A lot of it is things like that that you don't even think about uh, that fans don't really pay much attention to, but a scout is constantly taking notes on those things because they want to see what kind of person this guy is. And then also, you know, they do campus visits too, where they'll go talk to people, like I said, around the campus. So they'll go talk to the janitor, the cafeteria worker, and just try to get an idea of who this guy is because they're making a multi-million dollar investment into this player. And you want to have as much information as possible uh, on the player. So I think that's, you know, one of the biggest misconceptions about scouts that, you know, they just travel the country and watch basketball just like every fan does and then try to see, okay, yeah, this guy's pretty good. Really, in reality, they're watching the game in a completely different way. And then not only that, but they're, when they're not watching games in person, they're watching so much film. Uh, in today's day and age, there's just so much film out there. Synergy Sports is a really big film uh, platform that all the scouts and all teams use. And basically what it does is uh, it gives you every single clip of a player's career, international, college, NBA. So you can go type in, you know, any player and see, you know, how he does in the post or how he's done on every single one of his pull-up threes from the corner, you know, name the shot. Uh, so they, they spend tons of time watching film too. One of the scouts says that he spends uh, an average of eight hours a day watching film. So it's just really interesting, you know, hearing how they watch the game when they're in person and then the amount of work and film study that goes into this job as well. It's definitely a thankless job, something that they don't get a lot of credit for. They certainly don't get pay, as, uh, paid as much as the GMs or assistant GMs, but a lot of them are just grinding away because they're hoping eventually they can work their way up in a front office and get one of those bigger jobs. And maybe because they don't get paid as much, that leaves them vulnerable to another fact you had in that article, which is that agents try to bribe them with money to talk <laughs> up their guys at times. Not one, but two that scouts told you that. Yeah, that was my that was the biggest surprise of the entire article. I did not expect that going in. I had never heard anything like that. You know, I when I wrote about I wrote about agents recently and kind of what their life is like behind the scenes and I think everyone kind of knows that agents pay players and uh you know, even at the college level players are receiving money, but I'd never thought about agents trying to bribe scouts. Um but you know, two of the age or two of the different scouts I talked to said that they were offered money to basically uh, hype up a player to their boss and try to get that player drafted. Uh, one of the one of the agents uh, offered a portion of the player's commission from the contract. He said, "If you draft my guy, I'll give you a portion of the commission." The other one said that you know he was just offered cash up front to basically uh, just exaggerate in his scouting report and say, you know, this guy can shoot the ball really well. He can do this, this, this. The guy was being projected as a early second round pick and the agent was trying to get him pushed into the first round. So he had guaranteed money. So he offered the guy cash and, and both scouts turned it down and they thought it was ludicrous. They thought that was just crazy that uh, an agent would try to bribe them that way. Just because you can lose your, you can lose your entire career if you get caught doing something like that. And, and these scouts, you know, they take their job very seriously when they're writing a report and they're breaking down a player, if you're wrong about a guy and you put, you know, uh, you, you put your name out there and you uh, put your reputation on the line, then, and, and the guy's terrible or he doesn't work out, that's a strike against you. And that can hurt you. Uh, you know, you can lose your job and then that can hurt you when you're trying to get a job down the road. So uh, these agents laugh that off. Or, I'm sorry, the scouts laugh that off. Uh, the idea that they would take money <laughs> for a one time thing like this uh, when it could, you know, jeopardize their entire career. But, yeah, that was one of the biggest surprises for me. Uh, it makes me wonder because, I mean, you know, both scouts said they never took money, but you have to imagine it happens. Right. Uh, I'm sure scouts have done it. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things that you don't really think about in the NBA, but uh, I'm sure it's happened many times. Uh, Alex Kennedy's with us, HoopsHype.com. Uh, check out that article on the, the life of a scout. Really good stuff. Let's get into some of the NBA uh, storylines here. Uh, over the weekend, Mark Stein reporting the, uh, the Paul George, Kevin Love, possible three-way. It uh, doesn't seem like there's a lot more steam there, but uh, do you anticipate hearing Paul George's name throughout the offseason? Yeah, you're going to keep hearing Paul George's name all offseason just because – Indiana, they have, you know, they, they basically have to move him. Um, you don't want to enter the season with him on the roster just because that leads to so many 
distractions and issues. You know, I, I'm based out of Orlando, so I was here during the whole Dwight Howard situation when they kept him on the roster and he was there for media day and he was there for the start of the season. You know, we saw what happened with Carmelo Anthony in Denver when that happened. It's just a, a strange situation, and it's awkward for everyone involved. It's awkward for the star player, the teammates, the coaching staff, the front office, and no one wants to deal with that. If you know the guy is going to leave as a free agent, you want to get as much back for him in return. Right now, Indiana's talking to as many teams as possible. Um, obviously, Paul George wants to go to the Lakers. We've know, we know that. Um, and, and there's a deal to be had there if the, the Pacers want to do it. But they're trying to find a team that's willing to take on Paul George as a rental so that they can get some leverage and try to get more out of the Lakers or, or maybe get more out of one of these rental teams. You know, if a team like Cleveland or Boston uh, or the Clippers are willing to give up significant assets if that can beat a Lakers offer uh, for a one-year rental of Paul George, then uh, Indiana has to look at that. So I think that's what you're seeing right now. The Pacers are weighing their options, and they're going to keep doing that. Um, but I think we've seen Paul George play his last game with the Pacers. He's talked about finishing his contract out and you know uh, becoming a free agent. But I think we're going to see a trade. I, I can't imagine they would keep him throughout the entire season. Uh, and obviously, you know, you don't want to lose him for nothing. You ought to get something back in return for him. Uh, Carmelo Anthony, uh, Dwayne Wade, both those guys uh, could get bought out. Could they end up in Cleveland? It's possible. I, I know Dwayne Wade is unhappy right now after the Jimmy Butler trade. Um, he basically was told that uh, the team was going to be staying together, and then all of a sudden they traded Jimmy Butler to the Minnesota Timberwolves after he opted into his contract. So uh, Dwayne Wade – could be bought out. Um, I think he's regretting uh, opting into that contract. Um, you know, they're going younger right now in Chicago, so it, it could make sense for both sides to agree to a buyout. And, you know, it, it actually could work out for Wade because he would end up getting all of his money, or at least a big chunk of his money, uh, if they were to agree to a buyout. So I do think that's a possibility. With Carmelo Anthony, it's really, really hard to say because – um, you know, there's so much drama there. Uh, Bill Jackson wants to trade him. Uh, I think Carmelo, part of him, wants to <laughs> outlast uh, outlast Phil and uh, stay in New York. Uh, so I, I don't know if he gets bought out, but um, I think Wade is a possibility. Alex, is the culture in Chicago as bad as it's being made out to be? Um, it's it's pretty bad. Um, there were a lot of things that happened during the season, a lot of drama behind the scenes. Um, you know, at one point, remember, you had Rajon Rondo calling out, you know, his teammates on Instagram, and you had players that were kind of taking sides, and that's kind of been the case in recent years. It, it, was, it wasn't just this past year. Um, you know, even back when it when they had, you know, Derrick Rose, Joe Kim Noah, Pau Gasol, the, and, and Jimmy Butler, the, the locker room was really split. There was really, like, two clicks, and uh, the, the team was never really on the same page. They weren't really a cohesive group. Um, you know, they, they obviously have uh, moved on from, from Butler. Uh, Butler is someone that is a very talented player, but he is somewhat difficult. Um, I think we've learned that throughout his career. Um, he, he can be difficult off the court. He kind of has a reputation for being high maintenance a little bit. Um, you know, Rajon Rondo is one of the most difficult players in the NBA. So I, I think just the mix of personalities there made things pretty difficult. And then anytime you have a team that is kind of uh, a mix of youth and veterans, it's always kind of difficult too. Um, they obviously wanted to be able to make the playoffs and, uh, you know, make some noise, but at the same time they wanted – to develop their young players, and they made some strange trades, like trading away Taj Gibson, and uh, you know they got back Cameron Payne, and all of a sudden he's not even active on the roster. You know they they, they made some strange moves. They uh, had a lot of drama behind the scenes there, and now you have Dwayne Wade, you know, unhappy. And if if that if it's true that you know they told Dwayne and Jimmy that they were going to continue with that same core, and then you turn around and trade Jimmy Butler and Dwayne Wade you know, kind of gets tricked into opting in, then certainly things are going to be ugly. And uh, the culture is pretty bad there, if that's the case. All right, uh, Alex Kennedy, we got the awards tonight. Uh, by the way, before we get to the awards real fast, uh, the uh, big three was yesterday. That'll be on TV tonight. Uh, 
the uh, the three on three league. Mm-hmm. Allen Iverson had a bucket last night. You saw that. Uh, we have the video on our website. You could check that out. Uh, but they're running that on like what tape delay? Is that what they're doing? And they're going to run that uh, on Monday nights at eight o'clock. Is that what's happening? Yeah, basically they're playing the games on Sundays. Uh, they're selling tickets. Or every week they're going to be in a different uh, city. Uh, and they're going to play uh, the games, and they play them on tape delay the next night. Um, you know, I think in the future the plan is going to be to play the games live. They want to have a live TV deal, and that's going to happen at some point in the future. But right now they're on tape delay. But, um, you know, the league is, is pretty exciting. I watched some of the highlights uh, that they sent out earlier today, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of talented players in this league. I think that one thing you're seeing is that, you know, it's not – full court it's you know a half court three on three game so a lot of the guys that you know couldn't play in the nba anymore guys like richard lewis or um you know Allen iverson or uh you know name the player uh kenyon martin uh al harrington guys that uh, stephen jackson guys that you know can't make it through an 82 game season can't make it up and down the floor they still have the skill set to be able to uh, you know dominate a game or you know, knock down shots and, and do well in a half court setting. So it's still, a, you know, high quality basketball. And I think the fact that they got so many notable names makes it interesting. There's a lot of people that are going to watch just from a nostalgia factor. You want to see what Allen Iverson does. You want to see what Jermaine O'Neal does. Um, and then I think the coaching is really cool too. They got Dr. J, uh, George Gervin, Clyde Drexler, Rick Mahorn. You know, they got a lot of really big names uh, to coach, too, and I think that's a, a really fun aspect of it as well. All right. A uh, couple of awards real fast. We'll get Alex's pick on them. Uh, Alan, uh, Alan Iverson, jo- Joel Embiid and Dario Saric, both named to the first team uh, all-rookie team. They are both on the ballot for Rookie of the Year, Malcolm Brogdon as well. Who's your Rookie of the Year, Alex? Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's Joel Embiid. Um, even though he only played 31 games, this rookie class was just so weak. Uh, I look at I, I look at the numbers, and Embiid led everyone in points. He led everyone in rebounds, blocks, uh, double doubles. You know, he, he was fantastic despite playing 31 games. Um, most years, I would disqualify a guy for playing that few games, but he was just head and shoulders above everyone else. So, you know, I could see it going to Malcolm Brogdon. I think that um, you know, coaches love a guy like Malcolm Brogdon who can play both ends of the floor, who helped the playoff team, who really exceeded expectations and came in, you know, and really uh, thrived at, you know, after really being not talked about at all, being a second round pick. So I could see Brogdon winning it, but I would go and beat. Uh, who's your MVP? Russell Westbrook. I think if you average a triple double, you, you have to win it. Um, I could see James Harden winning it, but I just think people are going to look at, you know, Westbrook's numbers. And uh, I think the media is going to look at that and say, okay, we have to reward this. Um, You know, even though it wasn't, uh, he wasn't on a top team or, you know, one of the top teams in the, in the NBA, um, those numbers are just so insane. I think you kind of throw out history and, and give him the award. Uh, Alex Kennedy, HoopsHype.com. Check out the Hoops Hype podcast uh, at Alex Kennedy NBA on Twitter. And uh, check his stuff out over at HoopsHype.com. Thanks, Alex. Thanks a lot. Take care.